Specialist James McKeever, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed James in Petersburg, Virginia, February 16, 2007. He was 65 years old at the time. James is still with us today. He tells a great story as a petroleum specialist, uh, transporting fuel throughout Vietnam. And that's a very dangerous job, a high a target for the enemy to shoot at. And uh, he tells just so, uh, he has to, just has a unique perspective of Vietnam. And I just love these stories. I'm so happy to bring it to you today on the Voices of History channel here. I want to thank Bill Amer for making it possible for you to watch and listen to James' story. Bill, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your patriotism, your dedication to our veterans and this country, and for making it possible for a lot of people to hear and learn more about Vietnam through James McKeever's story. God bless you, Bill. Folks, if you'd like to become a sponsor of this work, I would encourage you to do so. There's information in the video description and on my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on Sponsor a Vet, include the veteran's name, and that's all you have to do. If you'd like to donate to the work, there's information in the comments section of this video. I'd like to also plug again Voices of History Radio, folks. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's on both app stores, and you can access it on my website, too, LarryCapetto.com. A lot of people are listening to it around the world, and it's just fun. It's great to have these stories. I tune into it all the time at my house, where, in my car, where I'm at. I just A lot of time that I have in my day that I can just click on, just like a song on a radio. You can listen to a story, and it just really encourages me. And I'm, I thank God for this opportunity to share these stories. So please take advantage of that and share it with a young person who needs to learn about why they're free and the freedoms and the cost for their freedoms, okay? Thank you for subscribing to this channel, for sharing this video, and I will talk to you on my next broadcast. God bless you. I was in Vietnam in 1968 and 69 and 70 and 71. Two tours? Two tours, yeah. So how old are you now? 65. So you were how young at your first tour there? <laughs> 30 years ago. My first tour, I uh, was in, the, uh, I forgot. Well, 40, I was 42. 40. No, I'm, I'm, at, I'm 42 in the 60s. I was... Uh, 42, 52, 62. I was about 30 in the 30s. All, it you're, seemed like that. It didn't seem like that. You were in my, your 20s when you were in Vietnam. Yeah, I was in my 20s, the first tour. Okay, well, did you enlist? Well, I was drafted. In the Army? I was drafted in the Army in 1960. 60? Okay, so, so Vietnam rolls around and you're... In the military? I've been in the military when when uh, when when Vietnam really got out. I'd been in the military uh, about seven years. So what was your rank at the time of Vietnam? First tour, I was an E four, E five. I'm sorry, E five. No, special specialist five. I was in a petroleum supply unit. Okay. Uh, uh, in uh, what is it? I think it was the five two eight. But believe it, it was a 528 uh, quartermaster company out of Fort Lee. They deactivated that uh, uh, unit, uh, especially to go to the Vietnam, as to take over the petroleum responsibilities for the Mekong Delta. Uh, so I was an E5, and uh, we departed uh, uh, as a unit, and we went to part of our units were spread it out like in petroleum supply. You have a uh, pipeline platoon, and you have three other petroleum supply platoons. And when we got into Vung Tau, this is the port town of Vietnam, I thought we were going to stay there, but <laughs> we didn't stay. The company stayed there, but we went to a place called Dung Tam. Mm -hmm. There where we begin to build uh, 
petroleum tanks, set up petroleum uh, bags and stuff in support of the NAF Infantry Division, who was not there yet but was coming. So your role is what now? You're a I was a I was a petroleum specialist. Okay. Now, did you get in a combat <clears throat> at all around combat? I got well. We got boarded every night, mm -hmm. or oh, we were in the midst of a. Uh, Dung, uh, to, to give you a little bit of information about Dung Tam, Dung Tam was drudged out of the water and put, was put as a base camp. Dung Tam didn't, ex they, they, Dung, they made Dung Tam existed by drudging out of the water. And it was more like a base camp, but it was centered in the Mekong Delta. If I had a map, I pretty well could show you. And so by drudging out of the water, and we were building it, roads, buildings, and we were, like I said, was in charge. We get mortared every night. Every night, sometime day and night, uh, it it really got where you didn't get no sleep because you were scared. And basically, they I they, that's how I got a Purple Heart. They hit the building that I was in. It, it we were it was forty some of us in the building, and and a little bit of all of us got a little bit of that 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 rocket that hit that building. It killed uh, several guys, but it it wounded maybe 15 or 20 guys, including myself. Uh, it's, again, at the time I was at E5, I didn't, once we lost, we lost a lot of NCOs in that. So they promoted a lot of NCOs. I was promoted to E6 at that time. And so uh, I stayed there until they, uh, until I, I'm trying to tease. I just I stayed there until uh, I was transferred back after a year. See, you're supposed to stay there six months, but I stayed there a year, mm -hmm. and was transferred back to to Vung Tao. Okay, that was the company headquarters back then. Let, let me ask you this now: When you first went in country in Vietnam, what do you remember about the sights, the sounds, the smells? I mean, do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, uh, again, we was on ships. If we. <clears throat> Yeah. We departed uh, from San Francisco okay. aboard the USS Upshaw. Mm -hmm. That's a troop ship. Okay. And when you come out into Vong Tau, it's a Vietnam from the sea. It's a beautiful country. And when you first see it, you know, before you get on the ground, it, it is a beautiful country. And uh, once we got in, 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 in country, you know, it's it just... The tensions, I guess it's the tensions of all oh, young guys. I'm a young guy, you know, and tensions. And you just went on about your work until the first shot. Then it changes what it does. What I seen happen there, after we got there, there were guys that were kids younger than me. But didn't take them long to become men. Didn't take them long to become men. And the difference in what I see, somebody else asked that question, and the difference what I see it, that happened to us and what I see that is in Vietnam, I'm going to say in Iraq, that we were trained in doing what we need. We knew what our jobs were. Basically, every soldier is trained to be infantry. They specialize. But we knew what our jobs were, and I, I'm, I'm sort of glad that we did because we could have lost a lot of people. As you take that picture I give you there, them, uh, we lost a lot of tankers, a lot of my friends were blew up in tankers and all the other things. It was a dangerous thing to move fuel from one point to the other in Vietnam because that's where they want to stop is the fuel and the ammo. So now the smell was like any other country, but when the smell, when I went up into the Mekong Delta, now that was a different environment because you were put up with snakes. You know, I ain't never seen a cobra before till I got to, to Mekong Delta. Uh, uh, all kinds of snakes, vipers, and these types of things. We were we had to clear out areas. And uh, a friend of mine uh, was another sergeant, buddy of mine had the detail of helping create the air, air airport, you know, a landing zone for the, for the airline for the for combat planes to come in small planes. And he we had back holes and uh, bucket loaders in the petroleum. He dug up, <laughs> he dug up a whole thing of cobras, and he ain't been right since. He still is not right, but the thing of it is, is that he was, he just, it just, I, was, I just told him, look, you just got to kill him. But I'm just saying, I wasn't used to that. But it didn't take me long because then, as in put into a leadership role, uh, that was that was a big responsibility for me because I never, it just, trust into that role and. 
one of the guys now are your, used to be your friends, now you're their boss. And so it, it, it took a little transition there to do that, and, but it, it worked itself out. Did you, uh, on, your, now on your second tour, were you doing the same type of job? I was petroleum supply. Okay. And my second tour, I was sent to back into the Mekong Delta. Believe it or not, back into the Mekong Delta. I knew of areas, but I had friends, because we had another platoon that was stationed in Canto. So when I got in country, they sent me back to Canto. I was in first in Mekong Delta, I mean, said in uh, Dung Tam, but when I got back in the country, they sent me to Canto, which was the Army had a, a base camp out in a place called Ben Tui. And out of Ben Tui, by this time, the NAF Infantry Division was there in place. So uh, what we did is, is petroleum support for, for NAF Infantry Divisions throughout the Mekong Delta. We had uh, uh, petroleum, uh, some like detachments in uh, uh, Sock Train, which is a little like uh, Ben Tui, Ben Long, uh, Canto. So we had them spread it out, and which that therefore was a little bit of danger for the guys, especially for the, for my section chiefs that were out there. At this time, I had made E7, which is, was a platoon sergeant, and therefore I had a bigger response. Even though I had a platoon leader, but most of your lieutenants, uh, they're good, but they gotta learn, mm -hmm. and they they don't. I've had some good ones, but they still didn't know. They know the basic thing, but they don't. They don't know all the things because that's all I ever done as an NCO. Can you give me just a little bit about who we're fighting in Vietnam? Well, the thing of it is, is that I also had Vietnam nationals to run the the the, the petroleum yard in uh, in Canto, where you have barrels, fifty-five gallon barrels, or uh, you move in uh, diesel and and uh, gasoline, and they and you package like oils and all these things. We had it all, and so we had hired Vietnamese to do that, to move it, move it around, and help us. And you know, we had stationary uh, fifty thousand gallon tanks, about four or five of them. And so basically, uh, we had them there. Now, who were you fighting? You don't know who you're fighting. The difference is in this war that the, we knew that some of these guys. You have to watch everybody because if he's trying to walk off or something, then he's trying to set you up for a mortar. That like, so you, you watch it, you really didn't know who you were fighting. And especially out in Sock Train and Venalong, them guys didn't know who they were fighting. They, they, they were out there in the midst of the Mekong Delta. And they, I always said, you, they, they work for you in the daytime and you fight them at night. Um, why do you think, James, that uh Vietnam has been referred to as an unpopular war. Where do you think that comes from? Well, I don't. I really don't think that they really wanted to go into Vietnam. They, they. I, I, I never ever got into the political end of it because I tell anybody this: being a soldier was my choice. So the political thing about being a soldier I had nothing to do with that. All thing I was do is do what I'm told. I think the experiences that we got when we came back to the United States. Let us know when, we, when I came into the airport in San Francisco. I, I knew, I knew, and when I flew out of San Francisco into uh, Washington, it wasn't as bad. But it was bad in San Francisco and Seattle. These places were bad for for people to come in, especially Vietnam vets. You in uniform and they, they baby killers. I ain't never killed no baby. I mean, I I was a soldier and I was difficult, but I never killed no baby, and I never I, I always. Watch out, the guys are getting court martialed today. I, I, I'm thinking that that that's the NCO responsibility. That that was my responsibility. And if I was stupid enough to let you do what you wanted to do, then then I deserve to get court martialed. Yeah, I, I, that leads me to another question about the homecoming that many uh, Vietnam veterans never got. Well, because I don't know. They, like, my family used to say it was an unpopular war. But it was an unpopular war. Nobody had the answer to why it was an unpopular war. If you're going to be the greatest nation in the world, and people, 
some people say, well, you shouldn't be a police, then you shouldn't be the greatest nation in the world because come with that of helping other people to achieve that independency, the way of our life, the way that a lot of people don't have that uh, way of life that we live. They don't, they don't, a lot of people in America don't understand that. You can do whatever the hell you want to do. You can go wherever you want to go, do whatever. You know, I know there are some things, some clicks into this thing, but they can't do that. They are at a poverty level. We think we ain't got nothing. Most countries I've been, they don't have nothing. You know, even though I come from Petersburg, here, Blanford, the poor, one of the poorest communities in the world, but I had food, I had a choice to get an education, and so they don't even have that choice. So I don't know why it was so unpopular. I really don't. I think it was the time that the students rebel. I think they were rebelling against uh, uh, our whole way of life during that time. The, the same old gods then is the same old gods that run in the country now. So it was screwed up then, and it's screwed up now. I mean, anybody that you, you can make any correlation you want, from Rumsfeld to Cheney to Nixon to Baker, all of them, to Mr. the first President Bush, they all were there. And they all had something in running the country. We used to teach the white male club. And they were the old white male club, and they still is, but they're losing their grip now because what worked then don't work now. So I don't know. I just didn't. They, they, it was a rebel against the system and anything that, that, that the Washington did that was not, the students, the fellas, though, that, that was not in their best interest, then it wasn't good for the country. You said that the young men or boys, they grew up fast. Why, why did you say that? What happened then? Because, because when you see people blown up, you go out in the country, you see people dead. In the first tour, our petroleum, when I was next to grave registration, I mean, uh, sometime I helped them in grave registration, identifying bodies, because basically, it wasn't but two of them, but if they had a big operation and they brought them in, you got bodies laying all over the place. So these guys seen this. And they never seen this before, you know. They understood that somebody out there didn't like you. And they, and they were uh, enemies of the country that you represent. And if you damn well better grow up and understand that they're your enemies. The race relation ain't got nothing to do with it, even though it had a whole lot to do with it in Vietnam. I used to tell them, they because you white or because you black or because you Hispanic, carry your ass out there. And tell them, wear that American flag, and then tell them, well, I don't know, I got, I got black power. Or I'm a white guy. Or I, I got La Raza. I got all this. But you forget that you're an American, and that's what make them grow up. That you are an American, and you're the target. Good point, man. That was good. Um, you the uncertainty in Vietnam, did that cause a lot of anxiety and stress, that, you know, not knowing who your enemy was at times? And well, they knew who they were. But the guys, guys knew who they were. You know, you tell a guy to look at because you got to be able to relieve your responsibility as a man sometime, you know. Uh, they, because they come up the water and, and offer you that service, sometimes you got to learn how to say no. They give you breaks. They give you R and R to go to places, or, or Australia. Or they give you in country R and R to go to Vong Tau, or along or, 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 or Cameron Bay, or something place that you could believe your feathers. But you can't just get anything and everything to come up the river. And you got to understand is is that everybody is your enemy in this country. What you do is you meet people who have the same emphasis for you because you hear you're saving them. But they're your enemies if their enemy comes and put the pressure on you. So everybody's your enemy. So you are there to not to suppress a person, but to maintain, to treat them with the utmost respect, but you keep them in front of you. And if you keep that attitude, you ain't going to let them get too close because they, you know, they talk about a suicide bombing. I know of incidents where Women put razor blades up in their vaginas and uh, uh, blow themselves up. It ain't nothing new, but it, 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 it was a rare occasion. 
not as, as, as much as going on now, but they knew that. They knew that. And so if well, only time that you didn't know your enemies when you dropped your guard. You think when the, the the soldiers were fighting in Vietnam, the the troops, you think they were conscious of fighting for God and country, or was it a matter of survival? I think it was both. I mean, you shit. You, it's a first and foremost, it's a matter of survival. Uh, did you love your country? No, I don't think. I don't think we have all of that 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 patriotic things that people wanted you think believe. But I believe that the thing of it is, is that they understood that in, in the United States there's a ward and punishment system. You fight or you, if you don't fight, then you go to court martial. It's simple as that. And if you, in phase of enemy, you the, the leader in that situation, any NGO or an officer, and you disobey an order in phase of combat, I can shoot you. So it, it's a matter of doing what you dare to do. It's not a matter of country, because why would I say it's a matter of country? I come out of Petersburg, Virginia. I went to segregated school. I was treated other than. Now, what is a, what is a matter of country? But with all of this, I still had more freedom than the people that I was fighting for. So basically, it wasn't a matter. It was a job to me. I enlisted in the Army. I was a career soldier, and I had a job. And that's what it was to me. Now, was I all that patriotic? No, hell no. Because there were so many things that were done bad and would continue to do bad. As soon as you fight, and in 1969, when I came back to Petersburg, I couldn't, still couldn't eat at the Trailway bus station. So would you say patriotic? Hell no. I had a job. And the job dictated what I'd done, what I needed to do. And I'd done that. Simple. Now. Uh, I, I, what, what these kids think, if you're a black kid from New York, you know, that's a different mentality. We could talk about that from, you can talk about if you were part of McNamara 100,000, these were uneducated uh, uh, white kids and black kids from all parts of the South who did not have the opportunity. Maybe that was an opportunity. But I don't think that when they go back and after they fight and go back, whether they lose a leg or something, go back into the same bullshit and you see the same things there, it ain't nothing changed. You don't, patriotic, you know, I, maybe now these kids got it because they got every opportunity. We had every opportunity. I still, a, a, believe it or not, some people might see this movie. I, I was still a nigga regardless. I was just there to fight and when you got when you use me and when you were finished with me you send me on simple when you work with the Gray's registration I mean what do you what do you what are you thinking about the families of these young men are you thinking about war as hell I mean what's going through your you don't mind? think what you do is you think about who's that identification is I didn't work I just helped them so therefore if you get an identification find out who they were identified with, and that's it. You don't think. Uh, you start to thinking, and thinking is a weakness. You can't think about their family and all the other things like that. War don't allow you to do that. Allow you to give you a moment thought about you, and then you got to go on. You still got a job to do. So, um, you know, just just going through the experience in Vietnam and coming home, um, you know, does, does does the war does Vietnam have significance in your life today? I mean, yeah. Well, the thing of it is, is basically I am in a program at the uh, 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 McGuire VA Hospital in Richmond, and it's called PTSD program. And that now they have done a lot of researching into this PTSD. Us. Uh, and, and what they're seeing is, is that trauma, things that you were experiencing, are things that are coming back to haunt me. I, like I seen my first sergeant blowing up with a hole in this thing. And every now and then, you know, you, you see that. And it comes back to get you. But most of all is it that it, it, my anger, my anger is beginning to come. I had a chance to, once I retired, I went to business for myself. But now that I have time to think, 
that's the worst thing in the world for a Vietnam veteran to be able to think because it created problems in your house, created problems with your kids, and, and that's because of the authoritarian type things that you learn in the military, and you, you, it is a different approach in civilian life. For instance, me and my wife, we go at it, but my wife stands her grounds, but I stand mine. But there is no communication there. It's just talking to each other. My kids, uh, we get along better now since I've been in this program because then I know how to relieve the stress that I have. I know how to, I'm learning how to deal with the anger. And uh, that's happened to me in my heart. It, it, it affects you a, a lot. And, and, and these groups of guys that I set with every Tuesday, uh, they have some they have some traumas. And I believe that, and as I tell them, you can't get well until you come to grips with what's wrong with you. I'm not a baby killer, so I ain't kill no baby. So I ain't got all of that, that baggage. But I was just saying, if you got that kind of baggage and all you got, you got to come to grips with the war forces things that you would not do. And deal with that and then come, then deal with all the other demons if you want to get well. Now, if you don't want to get well, then you continue to drink, use drugs, or do whatever. I don't need that. I need to be well to deal with my family and the anger and stuff that we, me and wife begin to talk. And that's because they have doctors now that beginning to understand what you went through. And because of what we're going through, we can help these guys come out of Iraq, Afghanistan. And that's very important, that there is a help thing now with them guys coming out now. They're coming out with a lot of more PTSD than we, we had, roadside bombs. Uh, you don't know who blowing up who. I mean, you, you're so scared that once you leave out your compound, you got to be scared. So all of these things can be dealt with when you get back. For instance, when they come back, now they can't afford dicks for more like a debriefing. I came home. <laughs> so flame stopped. I caught a flame from San Francisco to, to Washington and got to rent a car and went home. Nobody give a damn if, if I was a CNCO, if I went to a doctor and they said, uh, I'm crazy. Shit. I've been ruined. You know, but now they're beginning to understand it. It, it. it really helped me because the thing of it is is that one of the doctors we were talking about or a situation that I had in Bentui, which was race relations problems. I've had all kinds of race relations problems. I don't care what they tell you sitting here. They, the same problems that you had in society, in the city, in the states, we had them in Vietnam. And if they wasn't fighting, you really had them because they were separate. A white guy's over here. Black guys over here, Mexicans with the white guys, Puerto Ricans with the black guys. And the thing of it is, is that they identified themselves with red, black, and green, and all these other things, and, 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 and it had nothing to do with the mission. And they, 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 they fragged a few NCOs. You know about this, I don't have to tell you, but they did that. They shot at a few officers. They did, if you didn't do what they say you wanted, to do, then they come after you. If young kids, the, the battle for me as a senior NCO, well, do not allow them to force kids that did not want to be into this situation. You, I, will, I refuse to be handled by you. I refuse to be handled by any of them. And uh, they knew that. And uh, ain't no way in the hell you're going to handle me. I'm not going to allow you to handle me. I'm not going to allow you with your Ku Klux Klan's attitude and you with your black power attitudes, whatever. My attitude is military. If I tell you to jump in one of them tanks and do some more, that's your best bet. All right? And I had to maintain that. But I have to ask myself, as I was asking the doctor, why is it that I had to do that? People used to look at me, my commander looked at me as I was the answer. You know, some race problem called. Go get Sergeant McKeever. Uh, even though I reigned two thirds of the, the private while they were gone, and, uh, but go get Sergeant. You don't need to get Sergeant McKeever. You need to make. I used to tell the white non-commissioned officers to work for me. Do your job. You do your job, then I can help you. 
you scared, get your ass on out of here, find you some other job. And that, most of them were scared. Damn if I was scared. I still drank. I drank a lot. I was half drunk, and they, wasn't, they, they, they knew that what, I had a 38 in my belt. I had a 45. <laughs> they knew I'll use it. Did you work at all with the helicopters in Vietnam? Nah. They you at all? Yeah, they were right. We, 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 we supported them. Mm -hmm. We patrolled right beside, right next to my platoon headquarters were, were Canton Aviation, where they had uh, gunships, uh, Hueys, uh, uh, of observer choppers, we had the, you had a whole battalion, two battalions there of choppers. I seen a, a friend of mine to show you for how these guys, these evil minds work. A friend of mine who was a pretty tough first sergeant. It's his job in the morning to walk by and respect all the helicopters, and they didn't like him. So they tied, somebody put a grenade to, on the fuel cell. And when he opened it, blew him up and meat all over everywhere. And you see, that, that's, what, that's what you're faced with. That, so you got an inside fear of your own, and then you got the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese. But the thing of it is, is that the reason that a lot of NCOs probably sat here and couldn't deal with it because they didn't do their job. You just got to be, if you got to be an ass, be an ass. It's simple. I used to tell them, my mother pray for me every day and I'm going home to see her. And none of you gonna ever stop me from doing that. And if you don't do that, I could fight too, sir. And I could run, I, I was in excellent shape and they knew that. But all the, the thing about doing your job is people who need to be promoted, get them promoted. People who need help, get them help. People who need to be court martial or all the get them that too. But be fair and be just. That's all you had to do. And I didn't need no friends. I, got, I tell them I got six brothers. And seven sisters. I don't need a hell of a lot of friends. I, I got a whole lot of friends. I didn't, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to because I'm your leader. So you lost friends or that were wounded or killed in your tours. I mean, you knew people that were. Yeah, I lost. I lost a friend. Me and him left together. We both had same MOS, but he went up country. And uh, Roy, I'll never forget him. He's a member of Club 17. They still got his picture in the Club 17, which is up the street. He was there two months, and he opened up, and the tanker blew up with none left of him. And me and him left together. Uh, first sergeant uh, was a good guy, and when my, like I said, he died here on his arm. I uh, knew a lot of friends, but you know, soldiers, you give you a minute, and you're going about your job. That's the way that is. What would you tell a young person today about the price for freedom, um, having seen these things? I mean, how would you explain to them what they have? Because they don't even realize what they have. They don't care. We, we got a generation here. How do you explain this? Because I got kids in this generation. This generation here, for some reason or another, every generation, there has to be something. This generation here, if you look at what they want is, what did you do for me lately? How can I beat you out of something? Or it ain't what you can do for the country. What can you do for me? My son, your son, or anybody else's son. And they don't, I don't know, they, they feel like they got all the brains in the world. But we haven't made, and, and, you know, and I look at that, and this, this might get me in trouble, but I don't care, I can handle it. We have, even as a race, even the only thing I see that we as black people have done is change our name. We are now Afro-American. We ain't, we ain't doing a damn thing. We just doing the name thing. We got more doctors, lawyers, educated folks running around here, and boom, where are we at as a race of folk? We still, shit, we... If you look at the, the, the covert discrimination, de facto discrimination, and all the other things, the jobs and other, we still, we are better off then than we are now. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, oh, well, 
How did that happen? Because we try to assimilate in things that we don't most don't don't need. What we need is to go back and take that education and that and put it back in the community and help us keep these young people out of jail. We got more people in jail than anywhere else. We got more drug pushers and all on the corners. They don't know that they they just pushing somebody else's drugs. They don't know the difference. You can't tell them. So what you have to say to them is this. You must make the change. You must become an individual. If you think that the country that you are involved in is wrong, you must get involved. And you must, regardless of black, blue, blue, green, if it's wrong, you must get involved. As white people are finding out, the old God have really messed this country up. You have black people who try to assimilate the old God, they in, in a dilemma. And in the next two years or so, we might get this thing back together. But we got to do it together. And, we, and if you're not willing to do that, you're not willing to take a risk to get this thing together, then you don't have a right to talk. Have you ever been back to the Vietnam Wall? I don't go there. Why is that? I went there once. I don't, I don't need to go there. I don't need, I don't need to reminisce. Uh, I don't think I'm that. I'm sick, but I'm not that sick. I don't need, I don't need to hustle backwards. I need to continue to think positive and understanding. I'm, I'm learning all this in this class. I don't need to go back for healing. I need to be able to deal with decisions that I made as a senior non-commissioned officer, deal with them, make sure in my mind that I made the right decision, throw it behind me, and go on. Were there decisions that you made that were wrong? Or? Yeah, well, I, I often look back at myself and ask myself, did I treat black soldiers fair? Or did the system force me to treat them other ways? Did I make some good decisions that way? And that's what I deal with. That's well said. Um, what, why do you think, well, okay, let me ask this. What, what should people remember about Vietnam? What people should remember about the blunder the United States blunder, and, and that's probably why they're trying to stop Iraq from the same blunder. And then we had to cut tail and run. If there was no 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 negotiated peace, it was a chaos. Because I was just damn near dead about the ending of it, and it, and it and it was a chaos, and the people was trying to cut tail and run. And that's what we did. We cut tail and run. We a lot of people that were loyal to us, a lot of Vietnamese that were loyal to us, we left them by the wayside. And I, I don't know what happened to them. They said Vietnam has totally changed now. I don't know. I've never been back there. But I'm just saying to you, we need not to ever let that happen again. And I think American people finally woke up and said, okay, Mr. Bush, this ain't going to be no, we right now we need to cut our tails and run, but we need to find an honorable way out of this thing. We're not going to run off like we have, but we're going to find an honorable way out. And 10 or 20,000 more troops is not the honorable way out is what they're telling him. And maybe that's it, maybe we can find an honorable way out. But as long as you've got uh, 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 these guys with the al Qaeda's that, that, that believe in this religious, religious fanatics, that don't believe in freedom, that don't believe, if it comes on our shores, we'll deal with it. But don't tell, don't put the, use the scare tactics, well, if we stop here, they're going to come on our shores. If you in, 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 incorporate the things that you're supposed to be as a homeland security, they ain't coming on our shores. If we use our intelligence, uh, they're not coming on our shores. But we need to get an honorable way out. You, sometimes you've got to say, uh, even if you're the President of the United States, I made a mistake. And now I need your help in order to correct this mistake. Not use your position of power to say that you can't make a mistake, because you can. Are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran because I'm proud to be able to serve my country in whatever capacity that I could at my early age. And so that makes me proud. If I served in Vietnam, then that's what it is. Now, is my country right? No. Nah. <clears throat> but I would do it again. Do people thank you for your service? Every now and then, well, if I put this head on, you know. And, How does that make you feel? 
Yeah, I, I just ignore it. You know, it's a good thing. My mother told me a long time ago, and it's, and it's, and it's so pertinent today, that God gave you two ears. One to hear it, and the other one let the, it flow. That means if you didn't do it then, what the hell are you doing it now for? I don't need it now. I needed it then. And so if you thinking me, thank the kids that are doing something for you now. Don't thank me. That you, I'm proud to have served. I've already thanked me. I don't need you to stroke me now. What I need you to do is see the mistake that you, we made and, and treat these kids better than what you're treating them. Because these kids are not being treated fairly either. And when you do your documents, you're going to find out that they're not treated fairly. So thank them. Scroke them. Don't scroke me, but I will not embarrass you by coming in. I just use a two-ear method. I said, thank you. Oh, no, 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 that doesn't mean anything to me. What if somebody thanks you that wasn't even around in Vietnam? I mean, you know, after a, a teenager today, wouldn't that be different, though? No, it would be different because they're thanking me because their parents telling them to thank me. If they come to me with a different thing of what was your experiences, I could deal with that. Because I then can, can allay the experiences that, uh, 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 that I had in, in telling them about their responsibilities. And when I tell them about their responsibilities, whenever I speak, I don't speak as much, I tell them about their responsibility, and I can only tell them about their responsibility as it relates to me. Uh, I was a, a, a teenager, confused and everything in 1960. However, they drafted me, and they put me in an infantry unit for two years. With a, I was in a room with six guys. Four of them had master's degrees, and the other guy was like me. So. That was, an, and then they started talking to me about education. I never talked about it. They started helping me to understand. They helped me to read, to interpret, interpret words, and so on. And they were white. And I'd never been that close to a white dude before where I slept in the same room with them and we shared the same food. We go out in the field together. So it gave me. A, a new sense that I never had, that that was an experience that I never experienced. So I don't, I think you need to go back to the draft. I, if I had, if I, I would, would have never cut it loose because it, it was something that every person in this United States had was going to do an obligation. See, freedom is not cheap. We might think it is. Freedom is not cheap. They got to leave the United States to see how other people live to appreciate what you got here. And if you've never done that, then you can't appreciate what you got here. Well said, exactly. I agree totally with that. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty much done with my questions. Was there anything else you wanted to add? I think we covered quite a bit of ground. Well, I, I'm, I'm concerned that documentaries are good. They are good because they're, 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 they're history, and they are part of American history. But the effects, nobody done the effects of what have this war done on people. This is 30 years ago. And, and it still has effects now on, on causing this country millions and millions of dollars asked for to try to heal what happened in the 60s. But nobody, I've never seen a documentary on that. And I'm thinking that these are the things that can help young folk is what war does to you. And then at the end, what you can do to heal. Well, haven't you said a little bit about this stuff? Yeah, but you don't, you don't, you, but have you used ever, all the documents that you made, have you ever thought about that? In, in, in a war that had more effect than two wars? World War I and World War II did not have an effect on this country like Vietnam did. Uh, World War II, and the, I realize that they're in their 80s, but we still got guys walking around, don't even know their name. All messed up. Drink, alcoholic, drug addicts. But that's another question. <sighs> the perception of the Vietnam veteran, is it the drug user or the doctor and the lawyer and the professional person? It's a little bit of all of them. Yeah, I agree. 
It's a little bit of all of them because everybody comes out of that differently. Even the doctor. I sat in a class with colonels, doctors. It touched them. It might not have touched them then because you were busy. You were busy doing things and you ain't had time. You were busy. But once you start to stop and think, why one colonel was saying, well, <clears throat> I couldn't understand. I lost six jobs. Now that I'm 60 some years old, I realize why I lost six jobs. Every Vietnamese, Vietnam veteran has been married more than one time. 60, 65% of them. Or maybe more. I don't know the stats. But have been married more than one time. Some are married two or three times. I've been married three times. And now I'm beginning to figure out why. Because the thing of it is, is if you didn't say what I want you to say, the hell with you. It wasn't about building a partnership as what it's supposed to be about. It's about my way or the highway. And that's my mentality. Uh, shit, I've been in combat. I ain't got time to listen to all that garbage. I listened to it in Vietnam. Why well, I got to put it up with it in my house? So there's a whole lot of avenues that need to be approached. There's a no lot of things that need to be talked about, and that will help our future generation in dealing with walls. I believe that. I mean, I might be wrong, but I believe that that's what we need to do. We need to start to educate our young folk. And if we educate our young folks properly, we wouldn't have ended up with a, with a, with a generation like an all, all screwed up generation like this generation. Half of them in jail, half of them walking around, half of them don't care. And, that, and I think that comes with education. I can send you, I can send my daughter down to school or my son down to school, but I cannot teach them everything and I cannot, they understand my values, but my values ain't not what they got to deal with. They have to learn how to deal with people of their peer. And peer is the most dangerous thing in the world is peer pressure. How come so many Vietnam veterans have, have killed themselves? They can't deal with reality. That's all. I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> I can only tell you from what we've done setting in these. They can't deal with reality. They look. Some of them have done some horrible things over there. Let's 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 be real. Some of them have done some real horrible things over there, especially combat guys, especially these guys that were in that put out on these little villages and and they and they, they they go in there and they get fire and they go in there and they kill some people and it had nothing to do with the fire. I don't care who you are. It lingers. It lingers. Now you might not got caught, but you got caught because you know you done it. So if you can't stand it now that you're trying to think about it, what am I gonna do? You see, I don't have an outlet to talk. Now VA is doing some things, but I didn't before. I had no outlet to talk, so nobody would understand me. But I, that's it. Boom. Or whatever. Then all, my, all these demons are gone. I don't have to worry about them no more. Uh, I'm not spaceman no more. And well, it, it's scary. About 58,000 people were killed in Vietnam, but I heard that about 150,000 veterans have, have killed themselves. I uh, I can give you all the stats. I don't have them with me, but I surely know a man that has them all. So is this part of this after effect of the war you're talking about? And I mean, I doubt seriously if that many World War II veterans ever did that or Korea. Well, because they fought for a cause. The difference is when you went to World War II, that was of cause. You didn't want to speak Japanese or German. All right? Vietnam was somebody else's cause, somebody else's harm that, that wanted to do, and so many mistakes were made that we took from an advisory status to a full-fledged war. And so the things that happened there is still pertinent to these guys' mind. So yes, a lot of them came, did not make the adjustment. When we first started talking, I was telling you about the Iraq guys that come back and they go into Fort Dix or some other, other, and they do a debriefing type thing. They deal with that. Doctors and dentists will be able to identify these guys and pull them out and deal with them and get them some help. They had no help. 
and then they led to other things, drinking, drugs, and And then when the drunk, when the alcohol wore off and the drugs wore off, the thoughts came back. I mean, you can only take medicine but so long. It only suppresses you to go to sleep. It doesn't suppress you 24 hours a day. So yes, it came back and they just boom. I, I, do I ever thought about it? No, I never thought about it. If I, uh, it's just the way I was treated in this country. If I didn't commit suicide then, then why would I do it after Vietnam? It's, you know, to go and to, to be going to, uh, to, to Florida in the Cuban crisis and being stationed in Florida and, and, and the guys and the white guys could eat in the restaurant and I had to sit in the back of a douche and a half. I mean, if I didn't think about all of the treatment that I did here and didn't commit suicide, why would I do it after Vietnam? But there was a lot of people who were treated better. And did you ever do a stats as to how many was white, Hispanics, black? That's what you need to look into. And you're gonna find a, you're gonna find a, a big difference is a lot of them come from white middle class families. And they never ever had that experience before. And a lot of them, if you come from white middle class families from the South, that's a different story than the North. You know, you used to suppressing people. It was easy for you to suppress people that were different from you. And now this thing come back to get you. So basically you think it's the young man put in a combat situation in Vietnam, doing what he had to do, coming back home and not having a time to adjust or to transition back into civilian life. They never made it. So that's, that's, that's the big difference. That's a big, if you, I'm thinking if somebody did the research, I think they would have found that there were no transition and you couldn't tell it to your parents because your parents didn't understand what went on there. They didn't understand that. I don't know how anybody could understand. And I hear that a lot of times a veteran will only want to talk to another veteran. And, Maybe that's the case. That's the, and that is what been so successful for the PTSD program in, in McGuire. World War II, World War I, they got World War II groups. They got uh, uh, Vietnam groups. They got Iraq, Afghanistan groups. And then once a month, they put the Vietnamese, Vietnam group with the Iraq, Afghanistan. And they, they begin to talk about, about the military. And this been helpful to me. And, 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 and our experience has been helpful to them. Some of these guys are still on active duty. They just want to come in and just sit and, and listen as to what we went through as a generation. Sure. And, it, and, and, you know, there's a lot of guys over there, Civil Star, Bronze Star, uh, the Meritor of Service or Distinguished Service Cross. These guys, they knew that they, they, they paid their dues. And these guys understanding, and then they, then they could explain to a veteran what happened, why did I get that? I can explain it to another veteran, but I couldn't explain it to you. And so it, it's been very helpful. And then in, in the McGuire, what's sickening is I see guys from Iraq, legs gone. I tell my wife it's sometimes it, 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 it's more depressing to go over there. Legs gone, arm gone. But you know what ain't gone? Their state of mind is still very positive, and that—that's the key. And I—that—that—that—that's that, 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 my uplift when I see them. And I talk to these kids, and they—they they tell me, "Well, top, you know, uh, I'm happy, but don't worry about it. I don't worry about me, cause I'm—I'm I'm gonna get on out here, and I'm gonna go on with my life. I understand certain things, and that—that that, I couldn't have said that. You hear you go, ain't got no leg. Here you go, you ain't got no arm, but yet still you positive. Here you go, you shot up, your mother's with you or you're some other person, and they got a lot of Ben McGuire. That's why when you talk to me on the phone, I said, the next time you need to go and talk to them over in McGuire. They have your number because I gave it to them. But to talk to them doctors and, and, and just, just observe, don't take your camera, just observe what goes on into them groups. You're going to find out that everything you've done is worthwhile doing because basically you bring back mystery history but you come up with some solutions and if you can bring it back if you ain't got no solution we just reviling all bullshit that's all we don't it's the mcguire veterans administration the uh, mcguire yeah. hospital over in richmond yeah it's the va though. yeah and, okay we'll, we'll be in touch on that okay when i come back yeah and then you go with me i'll be more than happy to okay. 
Um, I'm at the end of the interview. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I hope it's okay. At the end of the interviews, I always like to have the veteran give me a salute into the camera. Would that be okay when I tell you to? Okay. okay hold on. Just from where you're seated there. Okay, go ahead. Right in the camera. There you go. Great. Nice.